Kenya's court upholds the president's electoral victory, but with many in the opposition refusing to recognize the ruling, while well, the country's political crisis worsened. I'm Imran Garta, and today's newsmaker is Kenya's political crisis. The court's verdict was swift, and so were the protests that followed. The justices ruled that while irregularities may have taken place during last month's presidential vote, they didn't affect the outcome. Their decision has handed Kenyatta a second term in office, but the opposition isn't taking yes for an answer. Kenyatta's main rival, Raila Odinga, is calling for international intervention as his supporters once again take to the streets. In the past, these protests have been deadly. It's not hard to see why they feel so emboldened. Kenya's Supreme Court became the first in Africa to overturn a presidential vote when it voided the initial results and called for a rerun. Now it looks like the judges are not able to end the country's political crisis. We'll debate what comes next, but first, this report by Natalie Perhernan. Kenya has been at a political crossroads for months. The deep division between supporters of President Uhuru Kenyatta and opposition leader Raila Odinga has had deadly consequences. More than 60 people have been killed in the ongoing violence following the two presidential elections this year. The Supreme Court made history when it annulled the August election results, citing irregularities and illegalities and called for a rerun. But the October poll proved polarizing. Odinga and his supporters boycotted the ballot, saying the repeat elections would not be free and fair. Less than 39% of eligible voters took part, but President Uhuru Kenyatta secured 98% of those votes. And the Supreme Court has once again played a pivotal role in Kenya's political future with this unanimous ruling. The presidential election of the 26th October is hereby upheld, as is the election of the third respondent. There is no perfect election. There will always be errors in an election. But you cannot invalidate an election unless those errors and discrepancies are of such a nature as to affect the actual outcome. That is the law. For the president's supporters, the result is one worth celebrating. But there's little doubt that's a reaction which will not be shared by opposition backers. Odinga says despite the court ruling, he does not recognize the government's legitimacy. And he's calling for outside help to end Kenya's political impasse. The international community must intervene at this stage and help to move this country from precipice. Otherwise, there's going to be turmoil in our country. Kenyatta is due to be sworn in for his second term by the end of November. But can that become a turning point for Kenya to move beyond the violence and political discord which has marred 2017? Natalie Pohunen, The Newsmakers. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined from Nairobi by Kimani Ichungwa. He's a member of the Kenyan National Assembly with the ruling Jubilee Party. Also in Nairobi, Patrick Gatara. He is a writer and political cartoonist with the online Kenyan current affairs portal, The Elephant. And in Johannesburg, Aisha Kaji. She's the executive director of the Freedom of Expression Institute. Thanks all of you for joining us. Patrick, let me start with you. Are you surprised by the Supreme Court's decision? Um, not really. Um, uh, I think it was uh, fairly obvious, um, uh, given everything that's gone before, especially since uh, the election itself, and given that uh, Raila Odinga wasn't running, um, uh, and also when the people who petitioned and how the judges had been ruling um, uh, was very reminiscent of uh, how they conducted the 2013 case, um, where everything was essentially agreed on an unanimous basis. Um, uh, so I don't think many people expected that uh, this would be reversed. And to be quite honest, given that it took quite a lot of courage for the judges to do it the first time, I think it was probably a step too far to expect that mm. they would do it another, a second time. Yeah, but I mean, that's an interesting way of looking at it. But 
isn't there another way to look at it to say that if you accepted the wisdom of the courts the first time around, why can't you accept the wisdom of the courts this time around, Patrick? Uh, well, the fact is, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, saying that they, they shouldn't have ruled the way they did. We really don't know why they did it. There hasn't been, uh, uh, I mean, we'll have to wait three weeks to get the reasoned and detailed judgment to know the reasons that they, uh, uh, they took this step. So um, I'm just pointing out that it would have been extremely difficult for them to issue uh, a, a, a ruling that was different. Right. Um, uh, the circumstances are not really the same as they were in, uh, in September. And um, uh, given the, all the tension and all the pressure that's been brought to bear on them, I think it, it, uh, I still hold that it would have taken quite a, a big leap of faith for them to annul it a second time. OK. Kimani, it's a divided country. Your side is celebrating victory right now. But isn't it a little bittersweet given that Kenyatta got 98% of the vote? Is that something really worth celebrating? Because that wasn't really any contest the last time around. I think for those of us who support President Kenyatta, we have every right to celebrate that we do so with a lot of civility and humility knowing that this is a win that in the first place we won on the 8th of August, not just on the 26th of October. We believed and we still believe to date that our win on 8th of August was unfairly taken away from us, but we said we are people who do respect the Constitution, we respect the rule of law, we respect in independent institutions like the Judiciary and the Electoral Bo uh, and Boundaries Commission, and we said we would abide by whatever decision the courts made. And therefore, I, I, in my thinking, it's a little bit insincere for anybody to even uh, purport not to support this decision right. by the court because it has not gone in the way they may have expected. Let me, let, I, I think it's only fair that fair if enough. we were able to live with the first judgment, we should also be able to live with this second judgment. Fair, fair enough, and I, po and I po posed that to Patrick. But Kimani, I mean, when you have somebody winning in the 90s, right, it shows you that the election wasn't really a level playing field. Now, I know there's an argument to say that if Ryla didn't want to take part, it's his problem, it's his business, it's going to go ahead anyway. But when you have somebody getting 98% of the vote, this is Bashar al-Assad territory when it comes to elections, right? Again, I ask you, isn't it a little bit bittersweet here? Because it's not quite a victory in a divided country when your candidate gets 98% of the vote. You're going to have a big portion of the country who, does, who don't feel that this is their president, especially when you think 61% of people didn't vote in that election. Isn't that a good point, Kimani? Let me tell you, even in the, in the August elections, 21% of the people did not vote, and that would not have in any way illegitimized the election. Let me also say that uh, the fact that 98% of the people voted, you cannot say that is not fair to anybody. I'll tell you, for, for instance, myself, I'm a living example that I sit in parliament today having been voted by 100% of the people in my constituency because I was elected and opposed. And therefore, the fact that one of the parties did not opted not to run in this election does not in any way illegitimize the election. This country is not uh, compulsory that every other candidate must present himself to an election. It is also not compulsory that every Kenyan must vote. It is a, it is a choice that people make, and it is your democratic choice who to vote for and whether to vote in the first place or not. Okay. Therefore, the fact that 98% of Kenyans did vote for Uhuru Kenyatta on the 26th of October, I think vindicates the position that we held before the, that date on August 8th, that 90, indeed and, and Uhuru again, Kenyatta had won the August 8th certainly with 90, a 94% of the vote. Certainly, 98% of the 39% of eligible voters who did vote, voted for Kenyatta, were the other front runner didn't participate. Aisha Kaji, where are we right now? We're in late November 2017. Is this a good time for Kenyan democracy or has the Supreme Court's decision pushed us into dangerous territory? Where are we? On, on your first point that you made with Mr. Gatara, um, you know, the judiciary that ruled in 
August, on the August election, is not the judiciary that ruled today. Um, there have been intimidation of judges. There, there's been threats against judges. There have been judges not turning up for key decisions, in some cases without reason, um, with Mr. Kenyatta refusing to postpone judgments, etc. So this is a very scared, very threatened judiciary, very different from the situation that we saw after the August poll. Secondly, as you've mentioned, less than 40 percent of the electorate turned out in a country where historically the electorate is eager to vote. There's at least 70 to 90 percent turnout. So you can really say that this rerun is not a legitimate victory for Mr. Kenyatta. It might be 98 percent, but that's 98 percent of less than 40 percent of the electorate. In a climate where laws are being passed or allowed to be passed, such as the electoral change law that's currently being ignored until it automatically becomes law, um, it's a country where the recommendations of the judiciary on the um, irregularities that were found in the first run of the elections were ignored. There was nothing done by the Electoral and Boundaries Commission to um, ensure that the same things did not happen again. And this is precisely right. the reason that Mr. Odinga refused to participate. Okay. So let's, so let's how look can at Odinga. You say this is legitimate. Okay, fair enough. Patrick, let's talk a little bit about Mr. Odinga's actions recently. He's called for a national resistance movement. He's called for civil disobedience. Yes, we're not seeing the violence that we saw, say, in 2007, which was atrocious violence, but people have died. Odinga feels hard done by, and he may well have a case. But is he being a bit irresponsible here? Is Odinga playing with fire, which might lead to many more people to die? Well, I think that, uh, yes, it's, it's, it's uh, perhaps, I mean, it, it, it is a good thing that we are not seeing violence, at least on the scale of 2007. Um, and I think it was always unlikely that we were going to get that scale of violence. But that said, I mean, there's still been quite a lot of deaths. If you count this going back to August, um, uh, we've had easily somewhere around 70 or 80 deaths um, uh, since then. And lots of this, um, as opposed to what happened in, uh, in 2007, have actually been perpetrated by the state. Um, and I think that it is incumbent mostly upon government to really rein in its own forces. People have every right to disagree with um, whatever verdict has been passed. They have every right to feel aggrieved and to express that grief and to express that um, uh, anger. And we should really allow them the opportunity to do this you know, rather than um, flood the streets with policemen um, uh, who end up killing people. The other day we sh saw them even uh, stoning cars, you know, the policemen, which is really, really uh, um, not professional behavior. You know, so I think that um, uh, it's, uh, we are now in a position where I think the, 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 the uh, uh, President Kenyatta has to take a step back. Yes, he, he has been declared validly elected. Uh, but he's got to understand that um, uh, his victory is contested. Um, there's a huge constituency of people who feel that he, she ha he has not been legitimately elected. And he's got to win them over, and he's got to try and bring the country together as is his constitutional okay. duty. Okay. So um, I think that um, going forward, if, 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 if he really wants to govern um, uh, the entire country and not just a small section of it, um, uh, he really needs to take a step back and see, uh, take the steps that are required to bring it all together. Okay, so Kimani, two points there. The first one, Patrick blaming the state more for the violence that we have seen. And secondly, the point he's making about Kenyatta to say, now's the time for the olive branch. Now's not the time for the victory dance because it's a divided society. Doesn't the man make a good point? Let me say I agree with Patrick, one, that Uhuru Kenyatta has a responsibility now as president, as a duly elected president, to keep the country together and hold us all together, irrespective of who uh, supported him or who did not support him. And he has taken his win just like he did after the August 8th election, with a lot of humility and calling for peace and calling on Kenyans to unite together and uh, uh, now reconsolidate all our energies and efforts towards rebuilding the nation. In terms of the violence being meted out uh, in the streets, I, I think it's preposterous for anybody to accuse the state. The state has a responsibility in maintaining law and order. We have seen hoodlums who are gathered by Raila Odinga and uh, his NASA coalition or what they, they now call a resistance movement. It is these hoodlums who are responsible largely 
for the breakdown of law and order. And the state has a responsibility in maintaining law and order. Let me also say what Aisha says, speaking from Johannesburg, is with a lot of ignorance of the Kenyan situation. The same judges, seven judges of the Supreme Court made a ruling in, in, in August, in, on September 1st. Five of, uh, four of them um, annulling the election and two a dissenting opinion as to the nullification of that election. This time round, the six judges who are sitting unanimously made a decision to uphold the election of the president. None of the judicial officers in this country has told anybody, not, not the local, not the international media, not in private, not publicly, that there has been any element of intimidation by the state on judicial officers. And I think we must and we should respect judicial officers for the decisions they take whether those decisions are in line with our thinking and those we support or not. Okay. And it is that so that we did Aisha on 1st of September. We agreed, okay. we disagreed with the court, but we respected that decision. Okay. Let those who also do not uh, agree with this, this decision, respect that decision and respect the judicial officers for who they are. Okay, so Aisha, why don't you... And the you state must... Uh, certainly, let okay. me add, the okay, state, Kimani, the Kimani, state Kimani, must now deal with Raila Odinga as a common criminal. Okay, hold on. Okay, we're going to address that in a moment because... That's another grenade you've thrown in there. We're going to address that in a moment. Let me first address what, uh, what you posed to Aisha. Aisha, why don't you respect the decision of the Supreme Court? It was a unanimous decision, and there's no evidence otherwise to prove that they are biased in any way. On the contrary, immediately after the first decision, when the Supreme Court said there ought to be a rerun, at that point, Mr. Kenyatta and his supporters called this a judicial coup. They made intimidatory statements, threatening statements in the media and in Parliament. Um, all of those have led up to the atmosphere of covert intimidation that is described in the reports of groups such as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, who have I also, I moreover, I spoken about police the Parliament of Kenya has never judiciary discussed the judicial killings. anywhere. Mr. Kenyatta called this Aisha, a judicial coup. The Kenyan, the Kenyan Parliament has never discussed the judiciary. The, yeah, true. We, Sorry, we I did, and I, we maintain to this day that it was a judicial coup. And we said we respected their decision as much as we disagreed with it. A judicial coup we implies that you're threatening the judiciary with repercussions. It is, it is not threatening. It is stating what we believed, that it was indeed a judicial coup. We said we shall revisit the matter because there are certain things that were not done right. There was okay. evidence that the registrar of the Supreme Court that time used a fraudulent report that guided the judges in okay. making that decision. So, okay, when so, we say we shall revisit okay. this, it is my position today, as, as, as a member of parliament, that indeed this country still needs to revisit the decision of September 1st okay, to, to so let me the truth okay, as to so, what informed that decision. So Aisha believes that calling it a judicial coup was an implicit threat. You believe it was not because you say you still, you still respected the decision. Patrick, let me ask you to address something that Kimani said because he threw a grenade in there towards the end of one of his answers. He said that Raila Odinga should be treated as a common criminal. This can't end well if that's going he to be the case. Uh, if the state follows that logic, yeah. this is not going to end well, is it, Patrick? No, it's not. And uh, actually, uh, Kimani Shongo, unfortunately, um, uh, demonstrates why Kenya is in such a, uh, uh, a pickle. It's because um, our politicians are unable to swallow their um, personal and uh, uh, interests and actually deal with what is in national interest. What we need now is some healing. We need some reconciliation. You know, uh, he might not like uh, Raila Odinga, and I don't ask him to like Raila Odinga. But he's got to acknowledge and he's got to see that Raila Odinga has a huge constituency. You know, six million people voted for him, even by Jubilee's own admission um, uh, in August 8th. Six million. You know, you can't dismiss those people. Think, you I can't Patrick, simply tell them that the, the person that represents them, you know, is a common okay, criminal. So no. Final, okay, so you final know, response from Kimani. You need to sit Kimani. down okay, and sit and talk. Fair enough. And, uh, fair, me, Patrick, me, Patrick me, let, me, let me give Kimani a chance for a final comment here, because we're running out of time. I want to give Kimani a chance at rebuttal. Go ahead, Kimani, Thank very you. briefly, please. Thank you. I, 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 
in reaction, in reaction to what Patrick said, I, I think more than anything I have said we have accepted this decision by the court with a lot of humility and now we have a responsibility to putting the, the country together Doesn't and sound forging like ahead. It. However, 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 this decision only goes to buttress the point that our constitution and the rule of law reign supreme above anybody else and whether it is Raila Odinga or whoever thinks or you have whatever number of followers, you must live by the rule of law and abide by the provisions of our constitution. You cannot be gathering hoodlums in the streets. You cannot be inciting people and profiling one ethnic community against the other and yet expect to, 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 to be served with justice and treated with respect. Okay. If you behave like every other common criminal out in the streets, you should be treated under the law as a common criminal, and I maintain that Raila Odinga has behaved, okay. continues to behave as a common criminal, gathering hoodlums, inciting Kenyans against each other, and the law now must take effect, it must take its cause, and action taken against Mr. Odinga. Okay. I understand that Raila Odinga is in Zanzibar at the moment. We'll be watching his movements and the political movements of Kenya very, very closely. Unfortunately, I've got a wrap, but it's been a pleasure talking to all of you. Kimani Ichungwa, Patrick Gatara, and Aisha Kaji. Thank you. I thank you all for joining us here on The Newsmakers. Still ahead on The Newsmakers is mass surveillance violating the rights of British citizens. A European court is expected to decide. And Chile's conservatives face off against the socialists in a battle for the presidency. Welcome back to the Newsmakers. Four years ago, a little-known NSA employee called Edward Snowden leaked a massive cache of files that unveiled some of the world's most secretive surveillance programs. While many people weren't surprised that the US and UK were snooping in their Facebook accounts, it gave privacy advocates the ammo to take their governments to court. And now the first legal challenge will be heard against the UK's three main spy agencies. They're accused of not just violating the privacy of Britons, but also their fundamental human rights. With more on this story, here's Shoaib Hassan. It's a major challenge to measures the British government says are essential to keep people safe. Ten human rights groups, including Amnesty International, have brought this challenge against electronic surveillance methods used by intelligence agencies to the European Court of Human Rights. They are trying to stop the mass surveillance used by UK and US national intelligence units. And you know, for us, the biggest concern we have when rich countries, the so-called champions of human rights, start doing this. Our biggest concern is the multiplier effect it has in places like Egypt and, you know, the, you have these people are running police states and they use the examples of the UK and the US and uh, France to say, you're no place to tell anybody about human rights anymore. The UK surveillance measures first became public knowledge in 2013, following revelations by the American security contractor Edward Snowden. The classified information leaked by Snowden focused on three bulk data interception programs. They're known as PRISM, Upstream and Tempura. Tempura enables the UK's GCHQ to intercept and store all internet activity that enters and exits the country. Upstream allows the US National Security Agency to do the same in America, while PRISM allows the NSA to access all communication passing through US companies. They include Microsoft, Apple, Google, Yahoo, Facebook, Skype, and YouTube. The data is shared between the agencies, and the British government says it's essential to prevent terror attacks. We have given compelling examples of major threats that were only discovered and repelled by the use of bulk data. They include the triggering of a manhunt for a known terrorist linked to previous attacks on the UK, and the highlighting of links between the terrorist and extremists in the UK. But the rights groups say government agencies can use the programs to identify whistleblowers and witnesses of human rights violations. They also say the measures infringe on individual privacy rights. But will their arguments be strong enough to sway the courts? Shweb Hassan, The Newsmakers.
Well, to discuss this, I'm joined now from Somerset by Bob Ayers. He's a retired intelligence officer and international security analyst. And from Glasgow, Amir Anwar. He's a criminal defense lawyer and a human rights campaigner. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Amir Anwar, let me begin with you. Do you believe that these civil rights groups have a case against the UK government? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, it's been described by campaigners as a watershed moment for freedom of speech, for the right to privacy, um, for citizens right across this planet. I think it's very significant that you have not just Amnesty International, but also Liberty, Liberty 11 human rights groups from four different parts of the four continents, from um, Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Americas, um, saying that this is unacceptable. Um, it's not compliant with human rights legislation. It interferes with our right to privacy, our right to freedom of expression, and the right to a fair trial. Um, and there is no need for the security agencies to have mass surveillance of literally every citizen on this planet. Bob Ayers, the plaintiffs believe that mass surveillance is taking place and that civil liberties are being curtailed. Is that how you see it? No, no not at all. Uh, the first point to make is that we're not talking about mass surveillance, we're talking about mass collection of data. That's not the same as surveillance, that's simply gathering the information, really? not necessarily even reviewing it. But there's another fundamental issue involved here, and that is whether or not there's an expectation of privacy on the internet. When you put information on the internet, you have no assurance of privacy. You're making it available to anyone who wants to look at that traffic. And so for people to claim that their privacy is violated when they put something on the internet is rather rather silly. It's like standing in a crowd and shouting something out and expecting no one to listen. Okay, so Amir, why don't you trust the government to be responsible with this information? They're just scooping it all up. It doesn't mean they're gonna do anything with it unless you have something to hide. How convenient for somebody who works for the, who used to work for the intelligence agencies to say something like that. What I'd say to any of your viewers is simply this. If you had, if you're living in a house and the police decided to climb through the window and photograph what you have in your wardrobes, what you have in your bedroom drawers on a daily basis and then take away that information and say, we're not going to use it, but it may be stored somewhere and used against you in the future, people will be outraged about that. And that's exactly what the governments are doing. The fact remains this. The reason why Amnesty International, Liberty and other organisations are standing up for the rights of individual citizens across this planet is that what this can is likely to do is impinge on those people that they're spying upon surveilling are, are individuals who are vulnerable sources people who are providing information people who are whistleblowers um, exactly the sort of people that security agencies want to turn their attentions to and quite honestly I have to say this this storage of mass data and information doesn't seem to be doing a lot of good in terms of the war on terror when we look at for instance the Manchester terror attack what we had was an individual that was on the radar of um, the security agencies, individuals who had actually phoned a hotline about this individual, and that information wasn't used. It simply comes down to this. There is no reason to store all the data of individuals. There's no protections and there's no safeguards. That's one of the fundamental issues when it comes to this. And also in terms of the right to a fair trial, the um, IPT, which is the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, part of that is held in private, which means that there is no right to fair trial because those, um, those who oppose it do not have a right to know what the information is. Now, that's un unacceptable. We have, over the years, been told about being trusting our government agencies and security agency, and time and time again, they have found to have been wanting. There's been scandal after scandal after scandal on where rogue agencies, but also not just rogue agencies, where agencies actually want to use that information, which has been shared with other intelligence agencies around this planet. So not just a case of GCHQ in the UK doing it, but they're sharing it with the United States, they're sharing it with others, and those intelligence agencies may well decide to use that information when it's not actually criminal behavior on behalf of those individuals but might choose to use it in the form of blackmail okay. might choose to use it in order to shut people down you, or actually certainly. systematically witch hunt people who are whistleblowers Fair enough. I mean, let me ask you is there ever a case for for example uh mi6 to share information with the cia or other american agencies if they can prove that they've they're, they're stopping a, a credible terror plot Absolutely, of course there is. I'm not, I'm not standing against that. Neither is Liberty or um, American Civil Liberty Union or Amnesty International. What we're talking about is that it should be targeted surveillance. Quite frankly, to have 
thousands of people sitting just collecting all this data for every citizen on this planet, every person in Europe, is simply useless. Because actually what it does is slow down the, 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 the source of the information. It should be targeted. And time and time again, we have seen those who are intelligence operatives on the ground, security agencies and police officers say that they need resources for targeted intelligence. Even in terms of, let's say, I would take the recent terror attacks that have taken place in Britain. In terms of carrying out a surveillance operation, it takes about 30 police officers to actually monitor an individual on a 24 hour seven day okay. basis. When so we actually see thousands of police officers being point. cut back, Certainly. this is a convenient excuse to say mass surveillance will somehow stop terror attacks. It won't. Okay, so let It'll me then ask probably Bob. make it worse because okay, so we won't let... have the police officers on the ground. Okay, so, so Bob, sometimes with all this technology, sometimes it becomes difficult to have the com conversation simply. So let's dial back all, all the technology and, and just think of this as maybe like wiretapping, right? Isn't it more efficient and more fair to get a court order to have reasonable suspicion of somebody before you tap their phone rather than to tap everybody's phone and have all this noise and then try to pluck out whatever might be relevant. Amir's saying this doesn't work. It's a bunch of noise and you don't even have the manpower to deal with it. What do you think, Bob? Well, I think, first of all, that if I can embrace the sort of concept that my colleague used when he opened his remarks, uh, how typical for a person who is a human rights lawyer to ignore reality and look for the most <laughs> trivial thing and escalate it into a major really? event. Now, back to your, I, I was quiet while your colleague ran his mouth for about 10 minutes. I could have gone down and had a cup of coffee while waiting for him to stop. Let's go back to the question at hand and debate points and not make speeches I didn't like run my, my mouth and I re and represent some of the most be vulnerable quiet. people in society. You may well be a retired intelligence official, but quite frankly, you're not working you on some case shut. right now. Okay, go ahead, Bob. Will you please take charge? Yes, please. Listen, I'm not in Guantanamo Bay for you to interrogate okay, me. Or to okay, insult okay, me okay. Like we got the point, right Amir. So. Okay, let the man finish his point. Listen, I'm, I'm go not ahead, Bob. Continue this if you can't control that man. You hear me? I'm not going to continue this if you can't control your guest. What are you going to do? He can't Send control the CIA out for me. You quite frankly, I mean, you're, quite frankly, your your they comments are unacceptable. With such a weasel like you. Okay, Amir, Amir, the man's got a choppy Skype connection. So to make things easier, just give him a chance to finish his his point. Go yes. ahead, Bob. Okay. He can. There, there is no point to make. There is no question before me. All I've heard was a human rights rant. I haven't heard a point yet. I haven't heard a fact yet. Now, if you want to put some facts on the table, we can talk facts. You can sit there and grin all you want, but all you do is talk and prevent anyone else from addressing what you're saying. You had a run-on statement. You, What's you your wrapped point? up just about... I don't have a point. Get to your I was point, waiting for you to make a Bob. point. Get to your po you don't have a point. You're the one that wants to run your mouth. We have a okay, point. Wait, That's on. why it's in Strasbourg. Amir, let me ask That's Bob, why it's at the European Bob, let me ask you a very Bob, let me ask you a very direct question, Bob. Tell me why you sure. feel there is a need for the bulk collection of data and then to sift through all of that data to find the bad guys rather than to identify who might be a reasonable threat and then to interrogate the information from that perspective. Tell me why you feel all the information needs to be scooped up first. Well, let's, let's talk about several of the recent events in London. There were attacks that were made. There were people that were killed. And after the event, the security services went back and looked at information that had been collected, but not exploited, collected, but not subjected to human scrutiny. They went through the information that had been collected and they were able to construct a pattern, a network, contacts, and other information that had direct relevance to the crime that had been committed. Now that's what happens when you have bulk collection of data. You have it available if you need to consult it. If you don't collect it, it's not available for consultation, it's not available for exploration, and it's certainly not available to try to apprehend or build a case against the criminal. Bob, do you have absolute trust in the authorities not to misuse the data? Because I remember speaking to Bill Binney, who helped the NSA uh, design a lot of this infrastructure and a lot of this technology. So you have these undersea cables. You can actually just sort of jump in. The, in the UK, they use Tempora, if I understand it correctly. There's Upstream and Prism. 
that the US uses, you can actually just jump in and sort of grab a whole bunch of data from the undersea cables and that gets stored forever and ever. Do you have absolute trust in the institutions, Bob, for any of that or none of that information to be used for the wrong purposes? I uh, do not have absolute trust in any individual in government to not violate the safe safeguards, the security, or the law. It's happened too many times in the past. We don't have to argue whether or not absolute trust is a possibility. It's not. But what we do have, at least in democratic countries, is we establish mechanisms to provide oversight for the intelligence operations conducted by that country. And those representatives are usually the elected representatives of the people. So what we're in effect doing is trusting an elected representative to ensure that the intelligence organizations operate within Actually, the law. not in the UK. Now, okay, so let's, let's take that to Amir. So sorry to interrupt you, Bob. Let's take that to Amir. Amir, in a democracy, with proper checks and balances, you have the oversight that you need. And if somebody screws up, they'll face the consequences. Absolutely. They'll go to jail for stealing people's information and so on. Abs this isn't China. Abs this is the UK, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Absolutely, and that's one of the reasons why this isn't on a whim. This isn't someone running off their mouth. This is why it is before the Strasbourg Court, European Court of Human Rights, because one of the arguments, one of the, th one of the th Three main, three main arguments. One of the central arguments here is that the IPT, the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, not elected representatives, as Bob likes to go, we're not in the United States, we're in the UK. Uh, what, what that actually is being said in that courtroom is that the there is no right to fair trial because part of the hearing is held in private. There is no discretion. There is no effective remedy. That's why it's been challenged because what Amnesty International and Liberty are saying is that there is, there is no effective remedy. There is no protections and there is no safeguards for those security agencies which Bob has no absolute trust in. Um, I, you know, in, in terms of that, there's no total trust in those organizations and security agencies, and that's why you need protections and safeguards, and the ones that exist at the moment are not sufficient. And what we need to see is more sufficient safeguards in order that we can challenge it as and when it's required. The argument, of course, that Bob used was that, you know, because if you put something on the Internet, that's almost like saying just because you use a telephone and phone somebody on your mobile, then we should have every single mobile phone call and every telephone call conversation listened into and hacked into. The, the issue arises again and again in terms of mass surveillance. If you carry out mass surveillance, and you can play semantics all you want, because that's what it is, is mass surveillance. It doesn't get around the point that Bob made, that during the attacks in the UK, we have seen time and time again, individuals who were on the security services radar, targeted intelligence did not take place, and as a result, people died. That is the question that should be asked, why more officers weren't detailed to follow those individuals? Why is we were let down? Why people in this country lost their lives as a result of that, rather than simply saying that the convenient excuse and the convenient way around this is mass surveillance. Okay. People will die People will die if we see more police okay, officers so let's on the streets okay. of London so, or so the rest Bob, of the country. So, so, Bob, Amir is disappointed that there isn't enough targeted attention at people who, I guess, are flagged, and he feels that everybody's wasting their time sifting through the fog, going through everybody else's private WhatsApp messages. Doesn't the man make a good point? I'm really not sure what the point is. On one hand, he's complaining that we shouldn't collect yeah, dictionary. a large amount of information on, and then I'm sorry, I didn't realize you know, we every quiet, citizen. On every citizen, Are you done now? as I said, I gave you a parallel example. Are you done now? Uh, no, I'm not done. As I said, every citizen, if somebody wanted to come in your house every day and photograph okay. what you've got in your bedroom drawers, your wardrobes, etc., you'd think you okay. would say that you so needed a warrant okay. to do that. So, so Bob, Why is it not okay. applicable to the Fair computers enough. or your internet? Fair enough, Amir. So, Bob, that analogy that this no. is just like no, somebody no. going through your wardrobe, address that. I, I hate, I hate to do this to you but I'm getting really tired of this. I can't make a point without being interrupted. You let the other man run his mouth on and on and on and talk over me. I'm not going to subject myself to this. I'm terminating this interview. I'll see you later, goodbye. You can't have a civil Bye. conversation here, Bob. I'm, I'm asking you a very direct question. Okay, so we lost Bob there. We're not gonna edit this out or anything. Okay, 
Amir, let me ask you about the UK then. We've lost Bob. Bob doesn't want to have yep. the conversation anymore. He feels uh -huh. he was treated unfairly. Let me broaden this out to the UK in general, yeah. right? And so uh -huh. we look at the Snoopers yes. Charter last year. And then we also, we look at mm -hmm. uh, the general trend in the country. There's a feeling, especially when you look at the fact that with CCTV cameras, um, British people, I guess, are seen more by CCTV cameras than any other citizens on the planet. Yes. Do you feel as if this kind of big brother police state is encroaching upon you and, uh, and encroaching on the rights of individual citizens? I think it is. Uh, it's, it's the issue comes down to this, and then the analogy I use is one that I mean I think most ordinary people, police always, op officers always say, if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear. But if somebody turned around to let's say a member of the public and say that there should be a camera installed in every single person's house, and don't worry about it because the police and the security agencies are actually going to look at it. They're never going to use it. It's just in case. It's that just in case argument that doesn't work because where you do have, we have seen time and time again where the police and the security service and we. Should shouldn't forget the security services aren't lily white in the United Kingdom. We are talking about organizations in the past such as Special Branch. We have seen numerous cases over the years with regards to the police where people have gone overboard, where people, have, uh, police officers and the members of the security services have broken the law in order to incriminate, in order to frame individuals and then subsequently many years later, 20 years, 25, 30 years later, we find out people were innocent or they had their lives destroyed because of the actions of the state. We saw it for prime example of that during the miners' strike, for instance. We saw examples of that during Hillsborough. We've seen that examples of that during, you know, the Stephen Lawrence inquiry, where members of the Lawrence family were spied on by, you know, the Metropolitan Police. We have an inquiry going on to spy cops at the moment. And what we see is examples of where well, you don't have the necessary protections and safeguards. And of course, the vast majority of sites says, well, you know, I've got nothing to hide, so I've got nothing to fear. And then lo and behold, one day, one day, you have a situation that arises where you think, I didn't do anything wrong. But all of a sudden, somebody delves into your past and you all of a sudden are framed or something is used against you where it might not be criminal, but all of a sudden a phone call takes place because we see it in many of the cases that we deal with. Security services will contact an individual and say, listen, we could turn your life upside down if you don't cooperate with us because we know this about your background. Right. We know, for instance, that you're having an affair with someone. We know that, you're, you, that you are a homosexual. All these situations have occurred in the past, continue need to happen but it's not criminal behavior but the security services utilize the information that they have against you in order to put you in a scenario that you do not want to be in and that is not um, acceptable in a civilized or a democratic society and bob incidentally like to talk about you know um, human rights lawyers shouting off their mouths we are what stands between you know, we are the ones who stand up for democracy and the right to a free society. My children, my family walk on the same streets and are just as likely to use the same transport system, are just as likely to walk across the same bridges and just as likely to be blown up by a terrorist attack or to be shot. I was in Barcelona on the streets the day that the, the gunman and the, the, the van drove for that crowd. I missed the van by seconds. Right by seconds. That does not make me say that we suspend our human rights or our civil democracy or the issues that we take that we take for often for granted because if we do, then the terrorists do win. Amir, the terrorists would like to see mass surveillance. The they would like to see every person in this country subjected to such surveillance. Okay. Amir, I'm also going to terminate this, but for the right reasons, I have to move on. It's okay. a pity that Bob had to leave us a little bit earlier on. He didn't want to continue with the debate, but it's been a pleasure That's talking a to both of you, Amir Anwar and Thank you. earlier Bob Ayers. It's a good conversation. We'll be looking forward to that verdict. Speak to you soon. We basically have two options. One is to further pursue the mistaken path of the new majority, which only leads to more frustration, more stagnation, more unemployment and more crime. The other path is to retake the path to better times, which we represent. Could South America be seeing another one of its governments shift to the right? Chile's presidential election was too close for an outright winner, but opinion polls suggest voters want a conservative as their next leader. The first round vote came down to these two candidates, billionaire and former president Sebastián Piñera and veteran journalist and first-term senator Alejandro Guillermo. Pinera has promised to revive economic growth, cut the corporate tax rate, and scale back labor and education reforms. But Guillermo has promised to deepen the
those reforms and increase spending on health care and pensions. The centre-left president, Michelle Bachelet, is on her way out after reaching the end of her term limits. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined by Christina Mani. She's a professor of Latin American politics at Oberlin College in Ohio. She's also the author of Democratization and Military Transformation in Argentina and Chile. Good to have you on the program, Christina. So Piñera won. He didn't get the majority that he wanted, just under 37 percent. What does that say about the current political climate in Chile? Well, I think the election has been a referendum um, on the last several administrations, both uh, Michelle Bachelet's and Piñera's. He was uh, promoted in the media heavily as being the clear front runner, but he came in under uh, the numbers that had been predicted. And of course, the surprise upset is that the candidate on the left, Beatriz Sanchez of the uh, the broad front, the Frente Amplio, mm -hmm. uh, came with a surprise third place at 20 percent, which mm -hmm. suggests there's a lot of discontent in the um, in the voting public. Uh, it was low turnout, lowest uh, in a long time. Um, they recently changed rules that make um, the voting uh, not obligatory, um, and that has had an impact. There's great disaffection, and so it's up to these politicians to show that they can be meaningful for voters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. As, as you mentioned, Ms. Sanchez was expected to get less than 10 percent, and she got more than 20. Okay, so Pinera will probably be back in power. He was in power in the past. From his time in power in the past, what can we learn and how can we look forward? What can we expect? Well, he has campaigned um, clearly saying that he would not uh, reverse the reforms of the Bachelet era. So he is not going to undo things that um, were fairly difficult to put into place and for many voters didn't go far enough or others went too far in terms of um, education reform, um, labor reform, and things like that, social issues, basically. Um, but I think we want to be careful that he is not a guaranteed win. We are going into a second round for right. the presidential vote. And if you do, if you do the math on the left, um, and if the left can rally its voters together around Guillermo, which I think is, uh, is a big question, um, it's not a given that he will win. He will mm -hmm. truly now have to fight harder than mm -hmm. it was imagined yesterday to win in the second round. Yeah, that, that's a good point. So, you know, just ju just to remind ourselves, Pinera getting just under 37 percent, Guillermo getting 22 percent, coming second. So we are going to another round. Let me then sort of ask a similar question from a different perspective. Where did Guillermo and Bachelet's party and that coalition get it wrong? so that they only got 22% of the vote when they expected much more. What did they do wrong? It may not be that they've done something wrong, but it's more that they represent something that is uh, now out of favor, and that's the establishment. Um, they are, he, even though Guillermo uh, is a relative newcomer to politics, um, he's a, he has a background as a journalist, um, Bachelet has a, a career in politics, um, so, but nonetheless, both of them represent the entrenched political interests that have basically run Chile for the last uh, 25 years or, or longer since the return of democracy. Um, and people are very dissatisfied with that, with the slow pace of improvements both to the economy and to um, uh, increasing the opportunities for those who don't have opportunities otherwise, so social issues, uh, closing the inequality gaps. Um, Piñera, I think, promises, uh, and, and his previous term showed, that he relies heavily on um, the market itself, right. the, the possibilities of economic growth, um, sort of with the, you know, the, the um, a laissez-faire approach. He comes from a business background. Um, and that has not solved Chile's problems. So let me, let me understand this. I mean, might there be a parallel with the United States where some people, in wanting to protest against the establishment candidate, go and vote for a billionaire businessman? They did that with Trump. Are some people doing the same thing with Piñera here? 
Well, I think Pinera actually represents the establishment, or the establishment on the right. Uh, he has a, a political coalition that's fairly well established. Um, it was significant when he won for the first time to bring the right to the presidency, the first time uh, since the return of democracy um, in 2010. But this would be a second term for him. And one of the things we keep seeing in Chile is the same old faces right. um, that you see Bachelet with two terms, um, Piñera potentially now with two terms, some of the other candidates who had been promoted earlier, um, uh, put forward, are names from the past. Yeah. Uh, we need new faces. And so Beatriz Sanchez of this uh, broad front was exactly that. That's a new coalition this year. And they picked up a number of seats in the Congress, and they're going to be a force to be um, listened to. Yeah, yeah I guess, yeah. yeah. Uh, in, so, uh, in, for, yeah. for the president going forward. Yeah, uh, Guillermo would, would do well, I guess, to try and court uh, Sanchez. Uh, broadly speaking, it, when we look back at this time in, in the history books, or when our uh, descendants look back at this time in the history books, are they going to be saying uh, Latin America had its Bolivarian leftist moment for a couple decades, and then it started to shift towards the right? There was a kind of correction going on. And are we in the middle of that correction now as we see Chile and other countries vote for right-wing parties? I, I think we do see that. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, it seemed very much that the era of uh, Hugo Chavez and a, a socialist alternative for Latin America was somehow at least in vision, if not possible. Um, we have seen a number of countries elect people with economics degrees and business backgrounds um, in Peru, in uh, Argentina, um, and now potentially again in Chile. But I think an important thing to remember is that in Chile, the, the political institutions um, are very strong. That's both a good thing and a bad thing. It's good because uh, the rules of the game are things that people actually have to follow and do, and I mean the politicians as well. Um, but on the other hand, it creates some stagnation. It makes it harder to push policy change through. Uh, and that's where we're seeing voter dissatisfaction uh, to bring in people who were not from the establishment, mm -hmm. like Sanchez. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 45% voter turnout. A lot of apathy. Interesting times ahead going into that second round. Christina Mani, I thank you very much for joining us on the Newsmakers. Good to talk to you. That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. You can check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Remember to like, follow, and subscribe. Next time, Palestinian factions take a step towards unity. Could 10 years of bitter rivalry be coming to an end? Until then, Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.